You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And got surrounded by five armed police cars um, at a roundabout during rush hour. And, um, yeah, they just literally, one of the um, CID jumped out of the car, came banging on the window, telling me, get out of the fucking car. You know, people say, like, you know, you knew what you was doing was wrong, why didn't you just leave? OK, I wish I did. Yeah, I did know what I was doing was wrong. Um, but until you've actually been in, you know, a situation like that, it's... It is difficult for people to understand because I didn't think I'd be in that position. You know, from the moment we was arrested, he never spoke to me again. Like, he didn't even ask if I was okay. I saw him several times in court. He never said anything to me, didn't even look at me. It was like he didn't even know me. And then when it got to, to court, magistrates tried to apply for bail again. And they said no, um, to a potential flight risk because I had connections to, you know, other countries. Um, so I got charged with a conspiracy supply class A. My barrister had said to me before we went up to court for sentencing, I spoke to him downstairs and he said to me, you're going to get 10 years. Boom, we're on. Oh. <laughs> oh he's, he's, ah. yeah, How are you, Emily? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? And today's guy, yeah, good, thanks. And today's guest, Emily Duff. Emily, you don't look the type, but you spent eight years in prison for drugs. Yes, but I did. Today's a chance to tell your story. Thank you. How are you, babe? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. You've Doing been out, right. what, now, three, four years? Uh, three years, four months now. Yeah. yeah. So <clears> a little while. Getting into the swing of things again, then? Finally, yeah. It's took a while, but mm. we're getting there. Just before we get into all the nitty gritty, I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Okay. Um, well, I grew up in West London, um, went to school there, grew up with my two older brothers and my mum. And yeah, I went to school and then went on to college. So yeah, pretty, I'd say a pretty normal upbringing. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, got all my GCSEs, then went on to college. I got a BTEC National Diploma in Public Services. Ironically, wanted to be a prison officer. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's probably... So a decent upbringing, career yeah. main, career driven yeah, kind of... Yeah, yeah. Worked from the age of 16. As soon as I could get a Saturday job, I got a Saturday job. Um, and yeah, worked all the time. What happened then? What happened? Well, what's what happens when you fall in love with the with the wrong person? Very easily manipulated. You think gullible? I didn't. I never thought I was. You know, I always thought that I was a really strong, independent. Spoke my mind. Wouldn't take no shit from no one. You know, I always thought that I was like that. Um, and then. Yeah, ended up meeting someone and it took a whole different turn. But, you know, at the time, when you're going through that situation, you you can't see it happening. You know, it's happening, but you don't know um, until it's too late, which I've come to learn, obviously, through doing courses and things like that and educating myself that I, I'm a, more aware now of why it happened and that not being my fault. Was it a bad boy image? I wouldn't have said that it was a bad boy image. I think at the point in my life when I met him, I was just looking for someone that was there, you know, and I was 21, nearly 22 at the time. Um, and I was just looking for someone that was there, someone that was, was able to support me, not financially, you know, just as a person and I th I thought he ticked all them boxes, you know, when I met him. Um, he was spontaneous, um, kind, charismatic, charming, all the kind of things that you would, you know, you would look for. 
That's not but, the kind of thing you see in a narcissist, but yeah. not, like, well, this is the thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what I know. <laughs> this is what I know now. But obviously, when you're when you're not educated in that, you know, you think that you know that's they're good qualities to have in a person, but. You know, he came on really quickly. It moved very fast. It was full on. And now I know that that's the red flag. You know, you should not, after a couple of weeks of knowing someone, someone shouldn't be, you know, declaring their undying love for you. But Love bombing kind of thing. Exactly. Yes. When did the red flag start to appear for you? <sighs> now I look back, because at the time I didn't see it, you know, and when I... I've done a course in domestic abuse now um, and they refer to it as like a drip in motion, you know, where it's done so subtly. So at the time you don't, yeah, you don't see it. But now I look back, I think, I think they was there pretty early on to be, if I'm honest with you, um, down to just little things, you know, me saying, oh, I wanted... I don't know. So I said, I fancy a Chinese and then turns up at your house with the Chinese, you know, like, and at, at first I was like, oh, but then it's like, mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Not that soon. Going out of your way. Some people, you can actually be too nice. Everybody looks for some that will want somebody who's nice. Yeah. But then when you get it, you go, mm, wait a minute, how, why are you too nice? Yeah. And what? this is the thing. Mm -hmm. So he was very nice at first. How old was he? A um, few years older than me. So I think, and I was, say when I was 21, 22, I think he must have been probably 29. It's a lot more years experience. So a few more years, yeah. And then obviously, as time went on, like, you know, a lot later down the line, I'd real, I found out, you know, a lot more about him in terms of his history and, you know, he had been to prison before and all of that kind of stuff. But obviously in the beginning, I wasn't aware of that. He never declared that? No. Why? Would that have turned you away, do you think? Um... I don't know if it would necessarily turn me away because I've always kind of been a believer in, you know, people can change and second chances and things like that. So I don't know if it would have necessarily turned me away. I'd like to hope maybe it would have, but it's hindsight. So. That can be an attraction as well, though. Yeah, it can be. Bad some boy. People, yeah. Did you ever have any incline that he was doing what he was doing or was he working or what? Well, he told me initially that um, he had shares in a garage. So I believe that um, I'd been to the garage, I'd seen how he was there, you know, when when he was there. I didn't really have any reason to, I was probably naive, to be honest with you. Um, but at the time, didn't really have any reason to to question it. Yeah, you're only a young girl as well. Yeah. Why should you be questioning yeah. it? If somebody's telling you something, you, you kind of take it as yeah. facts. When did things start to t t take a turn for the worst? So it started... Um, really subtly so at first um in terms of do you mean like in terms of my involvement in what i was doing yeah. just as in, in the relationship other, other telltale signs before it was it violent um, or anything? yeah he had been a couple of times like you know like shoved me about um he'd hit he hit me later on down the line like towards the end of um you know before we got arrested um but yeah, he was, yeah, just, you know, cheating, caught him cheating. And then I'd gone through his phone, but then it was my fault that I'd gone through his phone. Um, and then he'd put me down in my appearance. So he chipped away at me. In t so I lost my confidence, my self esteem, problem with self respect. Um, and yeah, I'm just made me just, think that no one would want me because that's what he used to say to me try and make you dependent on him yeah exactly and in terms of it isolated me from my friends and family so I'd had my own place initially when I met him and then um you know he said oh you deserve to be in a nicer area and you know then found me somewhere new to live and put me up in the in a hat in a flat it was a flat but it was a nice flat and um you know, took care of everything, said, you know, I, I'm going to do this for you. Um, 
and I just, you know, thought that it was being nice again, I guess. <laughs> How many times did you used to see each other? Every day, pretty much. So there was no kind of clue what it was up to no. behind the scenes? No. How no. um, many phones did they have? Well, initially just one, but then there was another, but then that was his work phone. So, and then, yeah, it just... Then it would start off with him saying to me, oh, can you just drive me up the road? I need to go and meet my pal or whatever. I said, yeah, okay. So I'd take him and then he'd go and meet someone. Didn't really, I was at a point then where I wouldn't, couldn't question him. You know, he used to say to me, don't ask me no questions, things like that. So that's how it started. And then that went on for a few weeks maybe. And then he would say to me, oh, you know where we went the other day? Would you mind just go in there for me and just grab something off my mate. So I'd be like, okay, so I'd go there and do it and ask no questions, grabbed whatever, then went back, gave it to him and that was it. Um, and then, yeah, it started off a thing where it was just money, you know, being around money. Um, and yeah, then it escalated. Were you working at the time? Yeah, I was working, I worked for Mercedes. So when he was telling you to pick up stuff, did you know what it was? Not initially, no. What were you picking up, do you know? At first, well, in the early stages was money. So I'd pick up money, obviously, if someone owed him money for whatever, I'd pick that up. How much? Um, started small, maybe a, grand, a couple of grand, whatever. And then over time, got a lot more. When did you start picking up the drugs? Um, probably, I'd say, maybe about six months into it or something. Four, five, yeah, probably between four and six months into it. What sort of gear? Cocaine. Did you mm -hmm. start chef selling it yourself? No, so I never, so it wasn't a thing where um, I would never sell. I didn't even get any of the money for it. You know, it wasn't like I was getting paid to do it or anything like that. Um so he would just say to me, can you go and drop this to, I don't know, John? And then I'd go and drop it and then go. That was it. It was nothing like, so then obviously whoever then it went to, they did whatever. So it was not like, I wasn't um, <clears throat> selling like directly to the user or anything like that. So just basically his runner? Yes. Mm. When did you realise it was drugs? Yeah, probably. Yeah, about that time, because the way he started, like, behaving and how he'd say to me, OK, like, you know, the way he was talking to me, you know, and in the, in the end I said to him, like, what's going on? <laughs> what, what am I doing? <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then he just made it a thing where it's like, you know, I, I trust you, you know, I wouldn't ask anyone else to do this for me, blah, blah, blah. You Manipulation know, so make tactics. Out, yeah, to make out that. Okay, well, he trusts me, you know, like mm. an idiot. Gullible bastard. So, yes, I know. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah. when did, were you just getting to that stage where you, you, you would have probably done anything for him? Yeah, definitely. I was, I lived on eggshells. You know, when you get to a point where you're scared of the person and you don't know what personality is going to walk through the door that day, you know, when the, key goes in the door what version is going to come through when you're living like that you know it just obviously you know people say like you know you knew what you were doing was wrong why didn't you just leave okay I wish I did yeah I did know what I was doing was wrong um but until you've actually been in you know a situation like that it's it is difficult for people to understand because I didn't think I'd be in that position you know, and I was. Do you think you were a target for him? Definitely. As soon as they met you? Or yes. Was it, post, was it love as well, where it's just so happened that he's got you, you'd do anything for him, so he's just pushed it that way, or was it a planned kind of grooming tactic? I think it was grooming. And the reason I say that is because, you know, from the moment we was arrested, he never spoke to me again. Like, he didn't even ask if I was okay. I saw him several times in court. He never said anything to me, didn't even look at me. It was like he didn't even know me. Um, and then once when I'd done that course around domestic abuse, 
they, you know, they said that when you meet someone, when you meet a perpetrator of domestic abuse, they're, they know what they're looking for. So they will f see a vulnerability in you that you don't even see yourself. And then they can use that to their advantage in order to be able to obviously manipulate a situation for their benefit. So where I was getting to know him thinking, you know, you know, I want to get to know him. I like him, blah, blah, blah. So I was genuinely wanting to get to know him, but he was getting to know me so he could find out what it was about me, you know, that he could potentially use against me. Did they have anybody else doing his running for him? Yeah. So there was five of us on the charge. Five girls? No. So um, there was me, there was one other girl, but she was, she wasn't anything to do with him. Um, and then there was two, two guys. So how long did this last? So um, I was under observation for 18 months. Oh, surveillance? Yeah. It's a long time. Did they ever catch him with anything? They never caught him with anything, but there was several text messages between um, him obviously giving orders, orchestrating. Conspiracy? Thing. Yeah. Did he get done with conspiracy? Yeah. What did he get? 16 and a half years. 16 and a half? Yeah. It's a big sentence, isn't it? Yeah, it's really big. But it started at 25 years. What did they catch him? What and eventually what was the, the full charges? Just conspiracy to supply? It's conspiracy to supply class A. How much was you driving about with at most? Um so I got caught with a kilo of cocaine and then the other guys that were on the charge, I think five kilos were seized in total at the time of um arrest. But obviously because it everyone was under surveillance, um and obviously they see you meeting people. So when it's a conspiracy charge, obviously they just have to prove that you had the intention um, to supply, whether it be drugs or money. You know, if there's an exchange, they were seeing exchanges of bags, um, and, you know, meeting various people. Um, and the, when I, the first day that I got seen, I was actually the person that I'd met that day they had been arrested however months not probably not long after that so there was yeah there was arrests that were being made with other people but they obviously their charges were separate out how many kilos was a sale in a week i don't know i i honestly don't know i mean i because a lot of the time it was money that i handled um but in terms of how much was moved, I don't know, because the other guys that were arrested, they were the ones that were mainly dealing with the drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I only used to step in if they weren't around. Because they had, I, I found this out in court when we went for, to court, um, that they had a whole van that was... Um, had been um, modified, you know, where they would... Stash. Yeah, so um, they said in court that it had been wired up to a point where there was a button that would press and then the insides of the van would move and then that's where the drugs were stored. But I didn't know any of this. I'd found, I only found this out in court. I didn't realise how big the operation was until I was in court. Some James Bond shit, aren't it? Yeah. So what happens when you're doing your thing you think, making a bit of dough with the man you you think you love like mm. everything's going sweet everything always goes sweet in that life but obviously you're maybe scared for your life yeah. but then the love bombing comes in yeah. he'll treat you well exactly. at some stages yeah. and then he'll put you down but yeah. that's just the, the traits of narcissism isn't it it's yeah. just um, and it's that cycle isn't it it's yeah. that constant cycle of abuse did you have any inkling that you were getting followed there was occasions yeah there was times when I thought I was being followed and then I would say to him I'm sure someone was following me and he'd be like oh, what car were they driving and then I'd tell him the car and then he'd be like oh no you're just being paranoid but clearly I wasn't because what was his previous there. um so he had previous four drugs um and from what I found out um I think one of the officers actually told me when I was in prison they looked on the computer and he hadn't actually been out that long before he met me 
Um, so, yeah, so it was obviously something that he 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 did often. So see when you knew it was drugs? Yeah. Were you just thinking, I just want to do anything to please this man? Yeah, so it was, yeah, basically to, yeah, to please him, to um, stay on his good side, if you like. How many beatings did you used to get? Was it frequent or was it just now and again? A, a majority of the time it was like psychological. And there was the few times where he would like grips me up like round my neck and shove me about. And then there was one time when um, we was in the house and I'd been on the phone to my friend. But he was sitting there, he'd come in and I was already on the phone to my friend and um, he, but I didn't get off the phone because it was, this was not too long before we was arrested and I was coming to a point that I'd found out stuff that he was living a double life and all this kind of stuff. And um, so I just thought I need to try and get away from him. So I thought when he comes in, I'm just going to stand my ground and, you know, just stay on the phone and whatever. So carried on talking to my friend on the phone for a good probably half an hour, 40 minutes. And then when I got up, then he, after that long, he sat there and he said, do you think I'm a dickhead? And then I was like, mm. then I shit myself. And I was like, oh, I thought we go. Hung up the phone and um, he was sitting on the sofa and... He was had a glass of wine and I'd walked into the kitchen and where the front room was, it was, um, you could see straight into the kitchen, the door. And I, I turned around and I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, you must think I'm a fucking dickhead. And then he threw the glass, like a full glass of wine at me from sitting on the sofa. And I managed to shut the... I shut the kitchen door. So the kitchen door obviously took the hit of the glass and then as then next thing you know he's come storming through screaming at me and I was staring at him and it was just like he he just went completely blank and then he just punched me around the face and he wasn't a small guy you know he was a big guy and um yeah I just like obviously dropped to the floor as I got back up he went to hit me again I don't know how I managed to dodge it but I did and um then when that happened, I was like, shit myself. But I was in my pajamas, you know, I was in a nighty, thinking, what am I going to do? I couldn't even think where my car keys were because I was just so like, what the fuck is going on? And um, so I managed to get out of the kitchen. I went into the bathroom to look at my face because it was like, poof, poof. and um, yeah, I looked in the bathroom. Then he was like following me around the house. So I'm thinking, what the fuck? Like, you know, I'm trying to get out of the way. So then I've gone into the bedroom, he's following me. And I was like, please stop following me. Please stop following me. And I've gone back in the bathroom, looking at my face again. He's come behind me. Then he was like, what's wrong? I said, what? He was like, why are you crying? I was like, what? And then he said, I said, you've just punched me around the face. He said, no, I didn't. I was like, what? What do you mean, no, you didn't? I thought I was going mad. You know, you think you're like going crazy. And I thought, you got to be joking me. And um, then I was in pieces crying. Next thing you know, I could hear him crying. He was in the front room, sitting at the dining table, crying. And I thought, and I, I walked in there and I thought, I thought I was hearing things. Walked in there, he's got his head in his hands, crying. Oh, I'm, I'm saying how sorry he was. I'm really sorry. You know, you just know what buttons to press. Then it was my fault because I made him do it then. Um, yeah, and then that was kind of a turning point for me, like where he'd hit me. I thought, oh, my God, I need to, I need to try and get away from this. Um, and the property that I was in at the time it was coming to the end of the tenancy and I thought I need to get out of here I need to get out of here and then obviously I then because he had done that to me and he was in the apologetic stage you know really sorry you know trying to fix it trying to make it right so I thought well I'm going to try and use this to my advantage so I just said to him look I think you know we might need some space I said I'm going to find somewhere else to live um and um yeah so I did that and then I didn't give him 
keys to the property that I'd moved to. And, um, but he was still there, you know, ringing me, contacting me. But at this point, then I wasn't doing anything for him. I said, like, obviously, I don't want no involvement, whatever. And um, he, yeah, he took, um, but he used to call me and he used to just turn up outside the flat as a little like an idiot, told him where it was. And um, he, um, but then he used to, like, be, he'd be at the flat before I got there and then he used to say things like oh shame you don't, I don't have a key then I could just be inside like waiting for you and then there was part of me for there was a little part of me that was like oh like should I and then, then I was like no 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 don't don't give him a key because once you give him a key then it's going to be even more difficult so then in that in that time it was only a couple of months really I think I moved into that flat in the March or the April of 2015 um and then ended up we get ended up getting arrested in the September um but yeah and in that time I would then started like trying to because by this point then I wasn't working um he made me leave my job and so I thought All right, I'm gonna get back into work now I'm gonna look for a job so I was trying to put things in place in order to try and get myself away from him but obviously it was a bit yeah. too late how much is that a regret that you took him back into your life when you had an out to go and move on or do you, do you think you couldn't move on because he was always there he was always there yeah he was always there and i think what is difficult is when you've got a trauma bond with someone that's really hard to break you know but i didn't realize at the time that that's even what it was do you know what I mean? And I've just found out, obviously, doing the course that I did in prison, that is a trauma bond. And when you're in that situation, it's so difficult. And apparently, on average, it takes a woman, she leaves a relationship seven times before she ends up leaving for good. Yeah, seven or ten. Isn't it? Yeah, like, something crazy like that. And you just think, you know, what, what are we doing? What about when you get busted? What happened? So when I got arrested... Um, I just picked up the kilo of coke and I was driving and yeah, then got surrounded by five unmarked police cars um, at a roundabout during rush hour. And um, yeah, they just literally, one of the um, CID jumped out of the car, came banging on the window, telling me, get out the fucking car. And I looked and I was like, me? You know, I was like, it just all happened so fast. And then um, he dragged me out of the car. And um, yeah, just, and he said to me, um, have you got any drugs on you? And I said, yeah. I said, it's under the passenger seat. Um, and he looked at me, he looked at me shocked that I'd said it. But to be honest with you, I was relieved. I actually felt relieved because that day, I didn't want to go. He called me. I'd been out. I'd had a lovely day with my family. And he called me and he said, um, you know, can you do me a favour? And I said, no, because I knew where it was going. I said, no, 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 I can't. He said, please, please, Emily, please, like, please. And, and I said, no, I don't want to. I told you I'm not doing it anymore. And then I hung up the phone and rang me back. And this he rang me probably about four or five times. And... Um, he was like, please, I promise you, this is the last time. This is the last time. I'll never ask you again. Please, I just need you to do this one more time. Like, going on and on and on. And in the end, I obviously gave in. I said, all right. I said, but I promise you, this has to be the last time I don't want to do it. But I had this feeling in my gut, like, straight away that, yes, I knew. I knew something wasn't right that day. Did anybody know what you were doing? Did you ever tell anyone, no. parents or no. friends? No. Did you have to give everybody up thing that'd be in that life with him. Well, this is the thing, because of when you're in a controlling relationship like that, they do isolate you from friends and family. Like it was like it was it was wrong for me to want to go and see my family or want to go and spend time with my friends. And, you know, he'd be calling my phone and, you know, then if I didn't answer, he'd start threatening me and there were so many times where I'd be out and he'd start and then I'd literally, as soon as he used to ring my phone, I'd start like shaking, like my whole demeanour would change. And yeah, then I just, I, I used I used to leave on so many occasions I'd be out and then I'd be like, oh no, fuck this, I need to get back. 
So see when you get caught, you're yeah. going through the process. Did the coppers ever offered you a deal? No, they didn't offer me a deal. They um, Obviously, they arrested me. They took me straight to the police station. And, um, you know, one of the police officers who said to me, he was like, how have you got involved in this? And I was like, I wish I knew. Like, I don't even know how this has happened. And um, he was like, he has manipulated you to the max. And he said, um, he's like, we've just arrested him in this big, massive home with his partner and kids and all of this. And I was just like, what? That like, couldn't believe it. He was at and home before? With his partner and his kids. So he had a message and did you know about his kids? Um, well, I found out about her probably a week before I was arrested that she was pregnant. Yeah. So that just how, how routed it goes, the, the lies and the yeah. deceit. But again, anybody that sells drugs, and I've got many friends who've done bad shit, and mm. <clears throat> I just know the lies that goes with that life. Everything's yeah. a lie. Everything. Everything's a Literally game. Literally everything. Just to get that extra bit of money. Yeah. And people get thrown under buses left, right and centre. People die left, right and centre just for the sake of that paper, man. It's scary. It's so scary. It, honestly, it's so scary just to think that you, someone could go to that those lengths, you know, for... And you just think, like, like why me? Do you know what I mean? Like, why did... You have to. Why don't you just stick to people who are in that life? Do you know what I mean? Like I'd never been involved in that in my in my life. Never been around drugs or anything. So, com a completely different world to obviously how I grew up. And what you were thinking then? First night in the cells. Oh, that was horrific! Absolutely horrific. Mm. Um, <clears throat> cried constantly. Couldn't sleep. Like panic attacks, pacing up and down the cell. Um, I was strip searched as well, obviously, when I got there because drug-related offences, they usually do that. Um, and, yeah, just the first night I was there, well, I tried, because obviously I tried to get bail. My solicitor tried to get me bail. And um, he said, <clears throat> the police straight away was like, nah. You're not getting bail. Initially, they said no because for my safety. Um, and then when it got to to court, magistrates tried to apply for bail again, and they said no because um, you're a potential flight risk because I had connections to, you know, other countries. But they had my passport anyway, so I don't know where they thought I'd be going. Um, yeah, so the first night in the police cell I was there. Um, it was freezing. You know, I didn't. I, yeah, I know my rights now, but I didn't know that you could ask for a blanket. Do you know what I mean? No one offered me a blanket. I know people are like, oh, you're arrested, what do you want a blanket for? But, you know, it's, I was literally freezing. So what did you end up getting charged with? Um, so I got charged with conspiracy supply class A. Yeah, and got eight years, but they started at 16 years for me. Um, but they took time off for early guilty plea because I went guilty at our first, um, well, <clears throat> obviously it got thrown out of magistrates because it, it obviously can't be sentenced to magistrates for like that case. Mm -hmm. So I went to Crown. So the first time we appeared, appeared in Crown, I went guilty straight away because my barrister said, look, you know, obviously you've held your hands up. You said you was involved. Um, because obviously it wasn't, a, obviously I knew what I was doing was wrong. So I'm not going to sit there and try and go not guilty, go through a trial. You know, I did wrong. So obviously I deserve to <clears throat> get punished for it. So I went guilty at early, the earliest opportunity, even before that plea and case management hearing. And um, yeah, so they took time off for early guilty plea, um, previous good character, because the judge, he did recognise, oh, and mitigating circumstances, so surrounding the relationship. So the judge did recognise that, you know, if it wasn't for my relationship, with him he believes that there's no other reason as to why <clears throat> i would have been in that situation would you have got a 16 if you didn't plead um maybe not 16 i might have still had time taken off for like good character mitigating circumstances but obviously you get a third off if you go guilty early 
See, because you pleaded guilty, did no one ever try and get you to take the blame for it all? No. Or did... That if you've pled guilty as well, that... Why would did that not make you question it, that they've made you take a sentence instead of saying you weren't involved or you were bullied to, to do it? Like they could have done that as well if they were already caught. The other people. Yeah. It, well, this is my this was my thought process behind it because because you, you know, should never you should never let a woman take a fall well, no matter what if you're part of it. Yeah, I mean that would be my thought process, and you know what, when the defense his defense stood up um because everyone went guilty um oh did everybody plead everyone pleaded guilty yeah but obviously even though you plead guilty obviously you still get time to have a defense um so your barrister will you know fight your case and the first thing that his barrister said when he stood up in court was my client takes no responsibility for anybody's involvement um everyone that was involved was involved because they wanted to be and I remember sitting in the dock and I was like, I shook my head and I was like, you fucking jerk. And because I just thought, you know what, even if it, even if it didn't affect my, even if I still got sentenced, you know, I still got, you know, some form of a sentence. I just thought, how can you, what person could actually sit there and not say that I made her do it. Like that just, to me, that obviously just confirms even more so that what kind of, you know, character. Usually there'd be a deal on the table though for people to take their guilty plea and, other, and someone to get off, mm. especially the girl that... No, they didn't put anything on there. Mm. But it must have been high profile then for nobody to get any deals or... For yeah. You to get an eight. So when you get an eight, what are you thinking? Um, well, my barrister had said to me before we went up to court for sentencing, I uh, spoke to him downstairs and he said to me, you're going to get 10 years. And my dad, because I was remanded straight away, so obviously I wasn't released from the moment I was arrested, I went straight to prison. And um, when I was there, like, my dad and my brother came on the first visit and um, he said to me, my dad was like, you're going to get 10 years. Like you're going to get 10 years. So I kind of always had that in my head. He said, please, Emily, just have 10 years in your mind. And then anything less than that is a bonus. But, you know, for your own sake, just have that in your head. So I always had that in my head. And then my barrister said the same thing. Um, and then obviously when we got up to court and he started at 16 years, I was like, fucking hell. And then I just heard numbers. I just heard 16, 12, 10. And then he was like... So I'm going to sentence you to eight years. And then I was like, I turned around and I looked at my cousin and she was like, it's going to be all right. And then I walked out of the, because he, then he's like taking her down, you know, all very dramatic. Um, and then I walked out and I leant up against the wall and I just was, took a breath. But he had just been sentenced before me. Um, and as I looked up, he'd just gone in the lift and the lift doors were closing. And then he looked at me. And I just was like, um, yeah, and then I went down to the court cells and I'd already done six months on remand. Mm. So I just sat there and was like, OK, oh, you've done six months now. Right, that just means you've got three and a half years left to go, left to do. Um, so I was kind of already kind of like in the swing of mm -hmm. jail. So you were in a routine? Yeah. What jail were you in? I started off in Holloway. What was that like? Um, I mean, I was shitting myself at first. I was so scared. I rang my mum from the police station when they said that they was remanding me. I rang her from the police station. I was like, I'm going to Holloway. I was like, do you think I'm going to die? And then she was like, no, Emily, you're not going to die. You're going to be fine. Because um, you hear horror stories, don't you? And obviously you see what you see on TV and, you know, you just think that is going to be the worst place mm -hmm. possible. Um, but actually... It was all right. It was all right. How did your parents react to that? Like their, their baby daughter then getting an eight stretch, somebody who's putting in, doing well in their GCEs, mm. working for Merck, mm. bright future ahead of you, mm. bang, somebody comes into your life and turns it upside down. Like, how much stress did your parents go through oh with God, that? So much, so much. They was, 
I called my dad initially. He was the first person that I called from the police station. Because I was like, oh my God, I don't know who to call with something. And I can't call my mum because I thought she's going to be an absolute emotional wreck. Surprisingly, initially, she was very calm. But I think she was like that for my sake. And um, my dad was just like, he was like, oh, Emily, oh no. You know, he was quite calm. But then obviously I've come to realise, that you know, that they was absolutely devastated. Mixed emotions, really. My mum said, you know, she was heartbroken. She was, she was absolutely in pieces. She cried probably every single day for four years. <laughs> and, um, and angry. You know, they felt anger, obviously, that I'd gone through that, like, upset for me, that I'd experienced all, them, all those things. Yeah. What was prison like for you? Four years in there? Um, it was okay, to be honest with you. I think the the hardest thing about prison is obviously being away from friends and family. Um, and then, obviously, having your, your liberty taken away, you know, obviously losing all of that. But I feel like when you are there... You know, it's probably not as bad as what you would expect. Um, I mean, it's testing of times, of course, because you're surrounded by women constantly, hormones flying all over the place, and like, officers that can be difficult, you know, you're tested on a daily basis. Um, but I think as long as you keep your head in the gate, when you are there, then, you know, you can just focus on your time and obviously trying to get as much as you can out of the the experience, if you could call it. <laughs> What's the worst things you, you see in there, in prison? Um, I think I was quite lucky, you know, obviously, um, well, when I was in Holloway, I heard um, when someone got hot water and sugar thrown over them but that was on one of the other wings so I didn't see that um, another girl had a fight and ended up with a pair of tweezers in her eye um, didn't see the fight but saw her eye after and was like oh my god you know um, so I think I think I was quite lucky because when I was in Holloway I ended up getting enhanced and then when I went to Bronzefield they carried my enhancement over so I then ended up getting moved over to another block so I wasn't I wasn't in I wasn't around the on the rowdy blocks if you like mm. so I think I was quite lucky in that sense what sort of friends did you make in there did you make any good friends oh my god so many I mean because obviously when I got there um I ended up sharing with my Cody I'd never met her before I knew that one that day that I got arrested and um then we got to Holloway and we kind of lent on each other because obviously we just, we was like each other's comfort, you know, it's like we're both going through this together. We're on the charge together. And um, they let us go in a cell together, which a lot of people said is quite uncommon because they don't usually let Cody share. But they let us share. And um, yeah, she was pregnant at the time. And um, yeah, we just got on so well. Like we had... Um, we was there for each other. In that, those first six months were obviously really difficult, really difficult time. Who was that for her being pregnant in prison? Oh my God, awful. Awful. But what happens then? Like, does she have to give birth in prison or does she get took to a hospital? So you get taken to a hospital. When you're pregnant in prison, you get taken to a hospital. And, um, and then from there... She was lucky enough to get a space on the mother and baby unit in Bronzefield. Um, they don't have mother and baby units in every prison, unfortunately. Well, no, fortunately, I should say. Um, so there's only a few prisons that do have them. Um, so she was then able to ha have her baby with her. Um, and she only got three years. I say only, obviously, it's three years still. So she would have to do half of that. Um, she was able to get tag. Um so she was able to keep her baby with her for obviously for the duration of her sentence. But, you know, if people get longer sentences, then you can only keep your baby with you up to a period of 18 months. And then you'd have to send your baby out to family, hopefully, if you've got family. Um, but yeah, it was, it's a lot. I don't think babies should be in prison. No, definitely not. No. I don't even know that you could give 
birth and still be in prison with your baby. Yeah, yeah. So they'll take you to the hospital and then, yeah, then take you. I mean, they won't put you in a sweat box, but they will like take you in a taxi. Well, she went in an ambulance to the hospital and then from the hospital, um, or she went in. I, th I think she did go in a taxi or they give you, there's other prison type vans that aren't the, the boxes inside. Um, and yeah, and even if you've given birth just before you go to prison, you can then also make an application to have your baby brought in with you. Um, but the spaces are so limited. You know, there's obviously lots of people that give birth or have given birth just before they go to prison that aren't able to have their babies with them. I mean, it's... It's a shitty situation, isn't it? Because obviously you don't want your child in prison, but then you don't want to be without your child. Um, but there is an organisation called Birth Companions and they're actually doing a lot of work and campaigning um, to stop like women giving birth in prisons. Like prisons are no places for babies. Yeah, that's mad. I know. And I, I didn't even know that. I yeah. thought the babies get took off. You took to a home or no. took to care until you're out. No, they'll only go to care, obviously, if you don't have... Um, like a suitable mm -hmm. family member or friend or someone that you know social services obviously will agree for your child to go to did he ever make contact with you in never. prison never never spoke to me once no how does that make you feel um i'm fine with it now i'm i'm over it um obviously it says more about him than just about me um like I said, obviously, I was relieved when I was arrested because I thought, oh, great, I'm confined. This is it now. It's done. Like, there's no, there's no coming back from this. So I was happy, like, as happy as you can be, just to be away from that situation. But, um, yeah, no contact whatsoever. Um, obviously, like I said, didn't even ask me if I was okay, didn't even look at me, nothing. What was it like being around like, all the sex cases and that in there, like the women? Like, even though everybody talks about the men and the shit that they've done, but was, because in the women's prison, they're all mixed. Yeah. Like, what was that like? <sighs> really difficult. Really difficult. So when I got to Bronzefield, um, you go on house block two, which is um, basically like the induction house block that you'd go on like, when you first get there. And I'd got there and I was there for a little while. But then where Holloway was closing down. So when I left Holloway, that was the first, that was the last day that they weren't taking no more new prisoners because they'd already started shipping prisons out to obviously empty the jail. And um, so then that's why I ended up going to Bronzefield. And so when I was in Bronzefield, I'd been there for a little while, but obviously they were shop shipping Holloway prisoners out. Then obviously they're getting new prisoners in from court. Um so one of the officers come up to me and he said to me, oh, um, do you want to go to house block four? Now I'd heard straight away that house block four was where everyone was, you know, where you didn't want to be. And I was like, no, thanks. I was like, I'm fine here. And he was like, we well, got a shower in your room. You know, that was the perk of it. You got a shower in your room. I said, that's fine. I'll use the communal showers. I'm okay. Thank you. I don't need to go over there. And then, um, He's like, okay, you don't have to. Half an hour later, he'd come back and he's like, you need to pack your stuff. He said, you got to go to house block four. I said, I said, I don't want to go. And he was like, I know, because that when I that was when I asked you if you wanted to go, but now it's a direct order and you have to go. I was like, you are joking me. I was when I thought, fucking now, and I walked on the block and you know everything. And then obviously at first you don't know who's who. And who's in for what? So I got over there. I'm thinking, like, you know, people saying hello, and I was thinking, I don't, I don't know if I can say hello to you. I don't know if I can say hi. Um, and then, yeah, obviously, everyone talks in there, so it's not long before you know who's in for what. Um, but it is mad to think that, you know, a couple of doors down, you'll be sharing a cell with someone who's in for the most horrific event you could think of. What sort of was the worst sort of prisoners in there? that you'd heard of? Um, someone who, um, a mother whose kids were part of a paedophile ring. You know, she used to sell raffle tickets and things like that. It's fucking disturbing, isn't it? Yeah, very. I'm surprised the women that's allowed to mix that. Did they ever get battered or were they just left alone? Um, some did. Some did. I felt like maybe that happened more so in Holloway 
Um, Because Holloway, they're two completely different prisons. You know, Holloway was very old school in terms of, um, you know, the way the way it was with there was a clear line between prisoners and prison officers. You know, it was very, if you was at the office for too long talking, then you was a grass, you know, things like that. It was so different. Whereas in Bronzefield, those lines were very much blurred. You know, the officers would be going into people's rooms, sitting down, drinking tea and coffee. Um, the tea and coffee that the prisoners bought on the canteen out of their £15 a week, you know, eating their snacks and things like that. So, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't mind obviously getting on with the officer because it does make your life easier. Um, but I still think there needs to be that um, that line. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What sort of courses were you doing in prison? So when I was in Holloway, I did a multi-skills course. So that is, um, they teach you like painting and decorating, how to hang up pattern wallpaper, how to tile, how to change a tap, obviously all things that it's going to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to know how to do. Um, and then, um, yeah, then from there I went to Bronzefield and I did, I found out they did a hairdressing course. It was only a level one at the time in hairdressing. And I thought, oh, result. I've always wanted to do it, but just didn't have the... Um, I didn't have the time or the money to be able to obviously pay for it. Um, I know it might be hard to believe, <laughs> but I didn't have the money, I swear. And um, yeah, and then, so I did the level one in hairdressing, which I loved. I also did level one in the gym. So level one qualifications, you just work in the gym, can't be a PT or anything. Um, yeah, and then I did that, um, the level one, but there was a group of girls of us that were there and um, the ladies who run the salon, um, they thought that we was amazing. They really pushed to get funding for level two because with level one hairdressing, you just can't really do anything with it. You can't go out and work in a salon. So it's not going to really help you, you know, like when you're released, you know, and they worked really hard and they ended up getting um, funding for level two. So I did my level two in hairdressing as well. Um, so then became a qualified hairdresser. I worked up in the salon. They have a salon there in Bronzefield. Um, and the women can pay for treatments. They've got like a pod system. So the women can pay for treatments on there. And um, then they come up to the salon and then the girls, obviously uh, us women, we would then um, do their hair. So see, when you started doing the courses on yourself, when did yeah. it ever hit you what you'd done? Are we just kind of numb to it all? I was very numb at first, um, but I did the a, a course called Aurora, which is a domestic abuse course. Because um, obviously I blamed myself for a long time. You know, Emily, this is your fault. Like, why did you just stay there? Why didn't you get out? I was asking myself them same questions. You know, now you're sitting here doing four years in prison. For what? You know? And then... Um, yeah, then I did the course and uh, it was a week's course. So it was all day. I, I, well, I think it might have been four days if I'm right. I might be wrong, but I think it was four days. And um, so it was morning and afternoon session and they went through absolutely everything with us um, about, you know, the perpetrators, like what they're looking for and, you know, and everyone had a time to obviously explain kind of their situation and... Yeah, it took a professional to sit in front of me to turn around and actually say to me, this is not your fault. You know, he knew what he was doing. You're here not because of your fault. Obviously, yes, you broke the law. But in terms of how you became a part of it, you know, he knew what he was doing. And yeah, and then that was kind of probably the turning point for me in my sentence because once I heard that, I was like, oh, okay. And then I think that's when the healing and I was then able to obviously work on myself and try and build myself back up again. What was the steps you had to do? It was a first offender, do you know what I mean? It's a very large sentence. Yeah. Did you, did you have to go to an open prison before you get out? I did go to an open prison, yeah. So from, um, well, I was actually Rotelin, they call it, so release on temporary license from Bronzefield. So 
I managed to get a placement in a salon um, and I was going out to work from Bronzefield. I was actually the only prisoner at one point going out, out of like 500 women. And um, so I got this placement in, hair, in the hairdressers. But the only thing about Bronzefield, they weren't at that time, they wasn't... Um, it was okay going to work, but it wasn't paid work. It was voluntary. And also, <clears throat> sorry, and also they didn't allow you to go home. So my biggest thing was obviously I want to go home to my family. You know, I want day releases. I want home leaves. Um, so, yeah, it got to a point where I was like, okay, I need to go to open now. So I made a decision to go to open. It was the best thing that I did because... Obviously, as soon as you're there, they just get you into a job, you get into paid employment. Um, so you're earning, you know, decent wage, twelve, thirteen hundred pound a month. Um, and yeah, then get, get to go home and start obviously trying to integrate back into normal so life. How you what was it like coming out to normality for the first time? Oh, it's really difficult. How so? I felt like, I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. Um, you know, you hear people talking about being institutionalised and you think, oh, that's not going to happen to me. But I think it did happen to me. You know, I would go, um, I would go out and especially when I used to go to my mum's and obviously she was so happy that I was there. Of course she was. And, you know, she'd see everybody and, and I'd be in the house, you know, might be sitting there in my towel and, Sandra from down the road comes to the front door and she's like, oh, come be my daughter, you know, and then I'd go out and I'd be like, oh, you're right. But I just felt everywhere, I just felt awkward. You know, I felt uncomfortable everywhere. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I was, I was trying to be how they expected me to be, but I didn't feel like that. And then I used to, I used to feel relieved when I'd get back to the prison. I think, oh, okay, I can relax now. You know, you feel like you're, you're putting on this, Sure. This show, yeah. Where's your trust issues at, especially with men? Um, I feel like I'm a, I'm all right now. Yeah, I feel like I'm a lot better. But I think that's down to how I feel about myself now, you know. And um, I just feel like it would be wrong as well, like from what I know and, you know, all the different people that I've met and how I want to be perceived as well, you know, like to someone to get to know me and not judge me and you know not have these perceptions of me at the same time I think then when I meet someone you know it, it would be unfair for me to paint everybody with the same brush don't get me wrong I you know at first I very much had my guard up and you know it took me a long time um to open up and be trusting um but yeah, with in time, I think you get there. Yeah, because obviously, man, it's always at the back of your mind. What if? Of course, somebody comes in, does the same shit like you say. Love yeah. bombing's a real thing. Like of course, trauma bonding's a real thing. Yeah, it's. I believe every human's got narcissistic traits, all male and female. Like yeah, gen, I, like, I think so. I don't know about everyone, but I think yeah, somebody... we've got some sort of traits, so because even somebody being nice all the time, like that's a sense of like kind of narcissism that, that, that you can be like somebody picking too over friendly too over nice mm -hmm. and then you just go to question everything but like you say you just go to go with your thought your, your, your gut feeling that like you probably never thought the life that you led get into that life that you would never be doing an eight stretch man and then coming no out way. trying to rebuild your life like, like I lost everything you know I had to start all over again and you know I'm still I'm still working on it, you know, nowhere near where obviously where I want to be, but you know, I have to just be patient with myself and understand that, you know, things are going to take time and, you know, but it will obviously all work out eventually, but, you know, just, it does take a bit of time, but yeah, definitely, I think you do have to, mm. you have to definitely be a little bit weary because to protect yourself. Where do you go forward for the future? Um, I would say, um, well, just trying to, obviously now I'm at a point where I'm comfortable speaking about my experiences, you know, I probably didn't speak, I probably, for the first 18 months of getting out, 
I mean, I got out and then in the September and we went into lockdown in the March. Mm. So, which was a bit of a relief for me, actually, because then it kind of took the pressure off in terms of feeling like I've got to go out the house. I've got to see people, you know, because I really struggled with with anxiety. Um, So, yeah, now I think I'm at a point where obviously I can speak about it. Um, Yeah, I just want to use my experiences to help other people and educate people and, you know, so many people that I've spoken to recently, obviously they have no idea of what prison's like. And, you know, the amount of women who who speak to me now and say to me that, oh my God, you know, thank you so much for telling your story. Like you've helped me so much. I have women messaging me and, you know, it, that, then it just makes you think, okay, well, it was worth it. You know, it sounds stupid, but if I can use my experiences to help other people, then at least that some good has come out of it. Was there a lot of women in prison on drugs? There was, yeah, there was, in Brunsfield, there's a whole house block, house block one, and that whole house block houses women who come in. Um, if you've got drugs or alcohol in your system, you might not necessarily be um, an addict, but if you've got drugs or alcohol in your system when you come in, you will go into that house block. But most of the women on there were addicts. Um, so there is a lot of people that are in there Sad with addictions. Sad a lot of broken souls. Like, so many. Like, and you tend to see the majority are broken. Yeah, 100%. And that's what's sad. And, you know, I was speaking about it with one of my friends the other day because she, she used to use, I uh, met her in prison. And... Um, you know, I said to her, you know, how was, how did you find being in prison? Did you feel like there was that support there? Um, you know, as a, a user, did you feel like you had that support there to be able to, you know, go through that rehabilitation process in terms of your drug use? And it's not, it's not there. You know, there's only one prison she made me aware. There might be another, but she said there's only one prison that offers like an actual kind of rehab program and they do like the five steps. And, but Bronzeville didn't have that to offer. You know what I mean? But you've got all of those ladies in there who are suffering with addictions and they don't have that recovery. They have recovery workers, but unless you're going to really get into it and go through to the um get to the root cause of the issue that's why they're repeat offenders who was it going on your tiktok doing videos for the first time you nervous embarrassed oh my god i was so nervous the first video that i did i was so nervous because you just don't know what reaction you're going to get do you don't know um how people are going to perceive you or whatever but I just thought you know what that it is what it is so let me just um let me just tell it how it is that's all you can do you've got to own your own yeah. madness but everybody makes mistakes we all fuck up man there's no point in hanging behind that no there's nothing worse if somebody's got something on you and they go oh, I'm going to tell people this and that yeah. so you may as well just own your own story well this is the thing and I thought you know what um at least it's done on my terms, do you know what I mean? At least I'm the one that is being able to tell my story and say it from what I went through. And the response has been absolutely amazing. Like, I couldn't believe it. Obviously, there is negative people on there and you do get negative comments. And people have said to me, oh, well, you deserve to go to prison, you do the crime, you do the time, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, I did the time, four years of it. I held my hands up. I went guilty. I'm not, I'm not turning around saying that, you know, I didn't do anything wrong because I did. And I've, I've owned up to that and I've done the time. Um, and obviously, and as a result of that and spending four years in prison, I think I'm well within my rights to express my views and opinions on the criminal justice system because I've lived it. You know, most of the people that have something negative to say have not been in that environment you know or don't have any experiences around domestic abuse or anything like that but then they turn around and saying well I bet you was all right when you was making all the money well no actually I wasn't making any money because if I had 250 grand buried somewhere I'd be all right why why did you get an eight though like for first offense like it's a, it's a bit extreme no well it is extreme but um 
well, when it come to it, they said that it was a multi-million pound drug operation. So, and obviously they're saying, they said, you know, through through that 18 month period that there must have been, they well, the p- police say there must have been hundreds of kilos of cocaine that, you know, flooded the streets. But I, obviously I wasn't, you know, that might be a bit extreme. Um, I don't know how, obviously how much was, was put out there, but because it is a conspiracy, so they will, and then obviously they take into account what was seized at the time, and then obviously they they look at it like that. Street value as well. Yeah, exactly, they go by street value. Was there many drug dealer in prison, girls? Yeah, loads. loads. Was there? Yeah. What was the biggest crime, do you think, is it for the female prisoners? Drugs? Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of drugs cases. Um, a lot of fighting, you know, like drunk nights out fighting, a lot of those. Um, and then obviously the people on house block one were, um, probably in for like theft and things like that. Obviously doing things to mm-hmm. be able to fund their habits, unfortunately. You had the biggest sentence in there? Uh, Joanna Dennehy. She's the lifer. She's got life without parole. What'd she do? She killed like three or four men. You would definitely know. You must have heard of her. Somebody's mentioned her before. Yeah, she's probably the... Um, Somebody mentioned her. She wanted to know why. She killed the three men but took the... She took someone's dog. Took a dog? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think it was Nate mentioned yeah. her. Is that what she'd done, three men? Yeah. Sick. What was, what was she like? To be fair, she wasn't so bad. You know, like, I know people think, you know, people have said to me, oh my God, she must have been really scary, but... She wasn't so bad because her issue wasn't really with women. Do you know what I mean? Women and children, unless, like, depending on what your charge was. But, um, yeah, her issue was with men. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was times where I used to train with her in the gym and um, watch film with her. Not just me and her, obviously, there was a few people around. But, yeah. It's not that when you're in that environment, you forget what they've done. It's so different. It is so different, you know, because you're all in that same situation. Obviously, certain offences is a little bit different. But when you're all in that environment, you just kind of take each other on um, face value. value, Yeah. Yeah. And then you're all doing the time and going through it together. So plans for the future then? You're out, you're free, you're doing your TikTok. What is your TikTok for people to get involved? It's M underscore from prison to purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the big plans for the future? Um, First and foremost is to stay out of fucking prison. Yeah, obviously. Oh, I'm not going back. I (laughs) promise you that. There's no way that I'll be going back. Um, It's just, um, yeah, just seeing really where I can take this, you know, how far I can go with it. I'm my... My biggest thing about doing it as well, sorry, I just want to add, is that there is such obviously a stigma around people that go to prison, you know, and obviously a lot of people look at me and be like, I'd never think you'd go to prison. And that's my point. You know, you don't know. I thought I was going to go to prison and only see like certain individuals do you know what I mean but when I got there I couldn't be in favor from the truth there was people from all different walks of life um so and a lot of these women they're really educated women you know they've got so many great skills and qualities that would be an asset to any employer and I just think that the more people that can kind of understand that and give people a chance you know give people a second chance because we're not bad people we just made a bad choice yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I want people to to be more open-minded. Obviously, I, you can't, I can't change everybody, but if I can change a few people's perceptions, you know, and make them look at, um, obviously, I'm going to speak from a women's perspective, um, you know, make them look at women who've been to prison differently, then, you know, that's, that's good, I think. Yeah. Well, exactly, man, you can't live with regret. But for anybody watching that's maybe done something bad in the past, they can't let go of it. Yeah. What advice would you have for them? Um, I would say to them that um, there doesn't matter what you do, um, that there's always a way out. Um, there are opportunities there. There are companies, there are organisations that will hire you. You know, you just have to, don't let it define you. 
don't let it define who you are you know it doesn't have to it was a moment in your life and just try and look at it and try and take the positives from the situation yeah. enough, Emily. listen for coming on today and telling your story oh, babe, fair play to you like, thank you for having me fair play for doing the time coming out and trying to change your life oh, I appreciate like, it do you have anything to finish up on um no, not really, but thank you. I yeah, no, it. thank you. I hope you stay out of trouble, man. Yeah, I wish you all the best it. for the future. Thanks. Take care. You